I was originally going to talk about traffic uh, management in general, and then when I looked at the different talks which were presenting are being presented, I changed my mind, and I will talk about I'll make sort of what the startup companies call a forward-looking <laughs> talk. So this is a forward-looking talk on how instead of playing Nash, etc., why don't we just increase the throughput capability of the regular roads we have, right? And so the technology of connected vehicles allows you to dramatically increase the capacity of the roads. And so that's what I want to uh, talk about. Whoops. Uh, thing. Okay, so it has to do with intersections. And so let's just keep. So intersections are what controls the traffic in the urban streets, right? And in turn, the traffic is controlled by the way the red, yellow, green lights are programmed to react. And so my previous talk was going to be how you should design the, the control of the red, yellow, green lights. And 90% of the roads or the signals in the United States are controlled by so-called fixed time controls. So it goes from red, yellow, green, or the different phases in a fixed pattern. So it's an open loop periodic sequence. And there's a lot of theory about how you should do that. 10% do adaptive control, so they take actual measurements around the intersections from uh, sensors or maybe GPS traces and then adaptively control the red, yellow, green. So I'm not going to talk about that at all. And <clears throat> let me talk about something called the intersection capacity. So the intersection capacity is defined in the following way, and you can measure it. So I is a movement. So typically from each direction you have three movements, red, I mean left, straight, and right. So if you have a four intersections, you have 12 movements in all. And <clears throat> G sub I, so capital T is the cycle time when the whole thing will repeat. So maybe two minutes typically, or between one and two minutes. G sub I is the amount of green time that is devoted to movement number I. Right, so there are 12 movements, there's 12 of these G sub i's. S sub i is the so-called saturation flow rate for that movement. That is to say, if that movement had an infinite Q and that's staying green all the time, what is the number of vehicles that would go through right, in that particular movement? So the capacity of the intersection is the saturation rate of that, of that movement multiplied by the fraction of time that that movement is getting green. green. Right, so that's the capacity of the freeway. Typically, the saturation flow rate per lane is, per movement, is between 1,200 and 1,900 vehicles per hour. So that's sort of the typical things that you can go out and measure, and that's what you'd get. So let's take this particular standard intersection, and instead of considering 12 moves, I'm going to ignore the right turn, because the right turn you can do at any time. You don't have to wait for a green. So from each direction, you have two movements, a through movement and a left movement. So you have eight in all. So you have eight movements in all. And suppose the, the capacity of the road leading to that is about 1,900 vehicles per hour. So the total available traffic coming into the intersection is about 1,900 times eight. However, Eight, all these eight movements cannot go through the intersection at the same time, right, obviously. And so what you're permitted for non-interference is only two movements at a time. Right? So you can see they go north-south and south mode, or both ties take left, or one goes through and left, so only two movements are, are permitted at a time. So the intersection capacity, if the saturation flow rate for each of those is 1,900, the intersection capacity is 3,800. The capacity of the roads leading to the network is four times as much. So the intersection capacity divided by lane capacity is one-fourth. 
So the intersection is the main bottleneck in urban roads. Right? And if you dig deeper, the main bottleneck is the saturation flow rate for that particular intersection. Or that, right? So the proposal I want to make is to increase that saturation flow rate. Not to change anything else, not to change the signals, etc. But see how to do that. So here's an example, empirical data from some uh, intersection in Los Angeles. The speed limit on that road is 50 miles per hour. And so I'm looking at a, one particular uh, movement. And you see the first vehicle, which leaves after the green starts, it takes three and a half seconds or 3.4 seconds before it reacts to that green and starts moving. And the next one's five point, et cetera. And the time before the green phase ends. So the phase in this particular case is 50 seconds long. So it started at 3.4 after the phase ends, and it left at so much time. So the amount of time it stood there was 3.88, and then it keeps decreasing. The speed, as, what it, as it entered the intersection, was first 17, 38, and keeps, the last one was really fast, <laughs> 73. So the average speed of the 12 vehicles is about 42 miles per hour, when you just do this average. And the vehicles 1 to 5 enter in 14 and a half seconds. So the empirical, empirical saturation rate, which is the first guys, is 3,600 divided by this. So it's 1,272 vehicles per hour. Notice that vehicles 5, 6, and 10 are travel at much faster speeds. So if you could move all these guys together at the higher speed, you'd have a much bigger saturation flow rate. Right? So that's the proposal. So the 12 vehicles together moved as a train, as a platoon, at 45 miles per hour with a time headway between vehicles of 0.75 seconds. The saturation flow rates would be that would be 4,800 vehicles per hour instead of the 1,200. You might say 0.75 is too aggressive, so let's make it 1.2 seconds, in which case the saturation flow rate would be 3,000 vehicles per hour, which is still two and a half times what you observe. Right? So it's about that much. Right? Note that the headway between, in the previous example between vehicle 7 and 8 was already 0.7 seconds. And we're, we're even saying 0.75 or 1.2. So the question is, can we move all these guys together? Right? So let's define the platoon capacity of an intersection instead of the current thing that we can measure. And we could suppose we could in a speed limit of 30 miles per hour, which is that much, and a space headway of 43 feet between vehicles, you would get a saturate, platoon saturation rate of 3,600, or 3,000 vehicles per hour, which is between 1.7 and 2.3 times more than you can. So that you could increase, in principle, you could increase the throughput by that sort of factor. Right? So there are two issues. Can this be done? <laughs> what is the technology? And number two, if you did that, what will happen in terms of queues and delays, etc.? OK? So that's the story. So first, let me see if this can be done. So here are experiments. This is an experiment in the Netherlands of a six-car platoon. So the way they have, not, in order to do that, you'd have to know when the other guy is leaving, right? I mean, that's the part. You don't wait for him to leave and then you say, oh, I should move and I should move. So they should move together. So we need some communication or some automatic way in which you'd keep the distance with the car in front. So this is a sick car platoon and they implement this because they each have simply an adaptive cruise control, which now many cars have, together with the Wi-Fi to give you some idea about when the vehicle is leaving. Right? And what they find is they can get the saturation uh, uh, space, a time headway of 0.75 seconds, so they can reach 4,800 vehicles per hour. Yeah? Do they know that the green isn't going to turn to red by the time the last vehicle of the platoon goes through? I'll come to that. So at this point, we're not worrying about those practical questions. So that those questions will certainly have to be answered. And some or the other, the intersection would have to signal break up the platoon or terminate it at this point, right? So simply doing a proof of concept here, <laughs> OK? So, <clears throat> so that's the, the uh, speed following of these. And so it's moving quite up and down. But this platoon is able to keep track of the previous vehicle. 
This is a four car platoon done here in, in, in uh, Richmond. And so this is much more aggressive. They're doing this and the thing is following. And so it has 0 0.6 six, six second headway at 60 miles per hour. So that can give you 5,100 vehicles per hour of uh, throughput. So let's for the moment suppose that we can do that. We can arrange things so everybody who is standing in front, queued up in front of the light is adaptive cruise control and their headways are, are set to be 1.2 seconds or one second, or more aggressively 0.7 seconds. We won't worry about the termination of this platoon when the, when the uh, green light would be over. So there's a pure productivity increase, right? Just from the way in which those cars are able to cure. And it increases saturation rate somewhere between 70 and 250% productivity increase is possible. So what can you use it for? Well, you can use it for increasing the throughput. So providing, supporting a lot more demand on that order, higher demand with no changes in infrastructure other than the changes required for communication and control of this platooning business, right? The adaptive cruise control part is already there, so we don't need to worry about it. We do have to worry about the length of the platoon and how many vehicles can go in and when can you shut them. So that's one way you can increase it, by increasing throughput. There's a, perhaps a more interesting use of it, which is you can reduce the queue length and the delay by reducing the cycle time. The queues form because of the red, right? During the red, the queues just, I mean, the vehicles just arrive and stack up. So if, instead of having green for 30 seconds and red for 30 seconds, I could reduce them green for 15 and red for 15 and green for 15 and red for 15, then your queue buildup will be reduced by a factor of two roughly, right? Why don't we do that? The reason we don't do that is because whenever you change this phase green, safety requires a three second of all red. So you don't have just green now and then green this way. You have a red period. So if you reduce that cycle time, you pay a penalty, right? But if I have so much productivity increases, maybe I can pay that penalty and reduce the speed. So let's see if they can provide some theoretical support for these uh, conjectures. So here's our network. I converted into a queuing network. So, so each movement is index i. So xi is the number of vehicles. I mean, that, uh, I mean each movement is an i, and xi is the number of vehicles who are stuck or, or queued up. When they get a green, they, they arrive at A sub I and they leave at rate B sub I and then they will turn depending upon some routing probability. So if BJ comes out, then RJI goes to uh, movement I and that's the travel time that it takes and so on. So you get a network like that. Now, the service rate of the ice queue is C i of t, that's the amount, that's the saturation flow rate multiplied by the average green duration. So that's C i of t, so it'll be periodic with period t. So it's a, right, when the light is green and C i of t is zero when it's red. So it's a queuing system which gets periodic service and non-service and service and non-service and service and non-service. X i of t is the queue length, departure rate, arrival, so. You can write down the model dynamics, which is simply the rate of cube growth is the arrivals minus the departures. The arrivals is the external arrivals plus the arrivals which come from the other intersections and their travel time. So this guy comes from intersection J to link number I. That's the travel time. That's the fraction which arrives. And the departure rate, if there is a Q, the departure rate will be proportional to the service rate. If there is, if the Q is negative, it's not possible. And when the Q is zero, the service rate is anywhere between zero and the full service rate, right? So this is a nonlinear equation and inclusion, but anyway, the end story is that there is a unique solution to this system of differential equations. And now let's think about, we're gonna parameterize this because I wanna change the service rate either double it or triple it or 50% more. And we'll take the input parameters of the system to be the external exogenous arrival rates, the service rates, and the initial state. 
And if you look at that system and you look stare at it a little bit, it turns out to be positively homogeneous with degree one. So that means that if I increase the that x of t, a of t, arrivals, queues, departures, if that's the solution of that system, and c is a factor of productivity increases, then c times x, c times a, c times b is a solution for that system. So that means that if I increase the service rate, uh, through uh, the saturation flow rate by 50%, then this thing can increase the throughput by 50% which intuitively is very, very clear. What happens to the queue length? I'm not changing the cycle time. So the queue length, we can see, will increase by exactly the same amount. So if I'm, in, if I'm doubling the throughput, so twice as much demand can go through, but I'm not changing the cycle time, then my queues will be double. Because twice as many vehicles arrive during the red. What about the delay? Right? So, I mean, this Q length growth may pose a problem, may cause a problem, but you will run into the previous intersection. Right? But what about the delay, assuming that that was not a problem? The average delay is the average Q length divided by the average arrival rate. The average Q length is doubled, the average arrival rate is doubled, so the average delay is unchanged. So, if you could accommodate all that traffic, you could send twice as much traffic through. You'd have twice as big queues, but you're not spending more time in the queue because you'll be moving through faster. Right? So the delay gets unchanged, but, and that's very obvious over here, so this is the arrival rate and the departure rate when c equal to 1. This is the arrival rate when, when uh, you double the demand and the departure rate when you double the demand. And you see that the delay between the nth vehicle in the first instance is the same as the two nth vehicle in the second instance. So delay is going to stay the same. Okay. But Q length may be too large. So can I trade off some of the productivity increases by reducing the cycle time, speeding that up, and reducing the delay? So what you, you, we had the time t, supposing I speed up the time, so just, which is essentially I'm, I'm making the system run faster, and you'll find that I can, if I increase my, my throughput by a factor of c, but I don't increase my demand by the same factor, but I speed everything up, then you'll find that the uh, q length decreases by the same amount. So I could leave everything the same, double my saturation flow rate, decrease my cycle time by 50%, don't increase the traffic, then everywhere we'll go through with the queue size will be decreased by 50%, the delay will be decreased by 50%. So the end result is that this productivity increase you can share in increased demand, and reduce delay by increasing the cycle time. So if I have a 100% possibility of increase, I can share it between 50% increased demand plus a reduction in the delay. So that is the bonus you get from this thing. This is an analysis of sim simulation of that in the same network that Alex discussed. So I'll skip through that. And it shows, the simulation shows exactly the kind of prediction that you expect. And leads to the following conclusion. Platooning technology can dramatically increase the capacity of the intersections, and therefore which you can now share between <coughs> increasing the demand, increasing traffic, or decreasing queues and delays. There are other possible safety benefits. Because it's moving in a platoon, you'll reduce rear-end crashes. A lot of the accidents on intersections are rear-end crashes. But there'll be a need to design the real-time communication and control 
protocols of platoons at the intersection, primarily having to do with deciding how large a platoon you want to permit. And so you have to signal that car number 13 or car number 10 or car number 12 is the last thing you should permit. That requires a communication among vehicles, but it seems to me possible that just with adaptive cruise control, without such communication, if you can signal that you should stop following that vehicle, or if you say it's the responsibility of the driver to obey the red light, right, then that platoon is automatically broken, right, when the, it's the driver's time to come. Right? So I'm not automating the whole thing, it's just making sure that if, if you are at the intersection and you push your adaptive cruise control and you say I want a 0.7 second gap, that's fine, or a 1.2 second gap, but when it turns red, <laughs> you better not go after that. Right? So that would be a very cheap introduction of this technology. Secondly, one of the last point, is that in the case of adaptive cruise control, you don't need all the vehicles to be like that. So the first three may be adaptive cruise control, the next two may be just the regular cars, and the next one is adaptive cruise control, so it'll follow the regular car in front, so you'll have a proportion increase, which will be in proportion to the penetration of adaptive cruise control technology that people are using, right? Yeah? So one other question at the same level of detail that you, you addressed right now. Do you allow the platoons to resort themselves at every intersection? Because otherwise, you have to plan your route in the beginning and join a platoon that's going to do exactly the same thing at all the intersections, which is an exponentially small fraction. Right. So here I'm saying I'm not going to, the platooning will only work to cross the intersection. After that, you're on your own. Right? Because notice that the capacity of the roads is four times the capacity of the intersection. So it's the intersection which is the bottleneck. So it's in, at the intersection that I want vehicles to not to have like a spring. One goes and then the next one goes and the third one gets impatient and moves faster and faster, right? So the only use, only use of this is at the intersection. There could be an additional benefit if you keep that platoon and it goes through. So then you have an extra benefit from other reasons, for example, if the lights are such that they're synchronized so that you'll go, you'll get a green wave, and if it's a platoon, then everybody will go through the green wave better, but this story doesn't have those additional benefits. Yeah? Yeah, actually I was going to ask something just related to the very last point you made, which is it, most of the loss is in coming to a halt and then re-accelerating. Most of the loss most of... Most of the loss of the capacity of an intersection. There's some physical loss because you have a factor of two at the intersection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have actually a factor of four and you could do better if the cars would, would arrive at the intersection still going 30 miles per hour. Yeah, so, so that, would be, that would be this, this uh, what is called offsets, designing of offsets, so that the travel time through the intersection exactly matches the offset between the green phases. So then you don't stop. Yeah, I mean, you want a pulse of traffic kind yeah. of as a wave. We'll go, that's right. That's, it's called the green wave. Yeah. So you, you're, you're coming at a green wave. Right. And if there was some way to tell drivers that this is coming, they would, it would, be, they would be incentivized, even if they have none of this technology, to... Uh... <laughs> yeah. So just to directly answer that point, there's a guy from BMW who came. I don't know if you know that San Jose publishes the traffic light schedules. You can get it. Yes. Uh, so, if you had a traffic light schedule for a city like San Jose, what BMW wanted was to have cars not stop for fuel efficiency reasons, in addition to this, of course. So, you would sort of know that that light is going to turn red even though it looks green. By the time you get there, it will be red. So, so um, don't stop, just sort of keep going at a low speed and then you just, you know, accelerate when it turns green. That's what he wanted to do. Uh, I, I think I'll create a pretty good question. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the major problems for that is, is clock synchronization. Yes. This is usually, when you start automating like this, it really it went on about this, and I completely appreciate it. Uh, but that's the other uh, thing. But but you know, if you have the schedules to publish, uh, San Jose is releasing it. But mind you, this benefit of doubling the throughput has nothing to do with. It's on top of all of those, right? I mean, this gives you a hundred percent increase in the, in the road traffic that you can tolerate 
those are all bonus things, number one. Number two, they require a lot more infrastructure development and calculation and, and this, depending on the speed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you'll have to change the way the offsets are synchronized and you need the intersection to be able to signal to the individual vehicles that the, the car, the light is going to turn red in three seconds, two seconds, whatever it is. So this is a very low-tech solution which only requires adaptive cruise control and the drivers to obey the red-green <laughs> light, right? Dick? How would uh, your solution adapt to uh, the non-compliant behavior where uh, the driver is slow on the uptake at starting at the intersection or if somebody changes lanes or a bicycle is involved? Um, mm -hmm. How could all of those uh, real-life variations affect so, so See what I'm proposing, right? I'm saying you are at the intersection. There's no bicycle. I mean, you are responsible <laughs> for <laughs> safety. Right? The only thing I'm saying is that you push, you, you adaptive cruise control, you, which are now is coming for stop-go traffic. You press it. It gives you some amount of uh, freedom, whether you want it to be aggressive, so then you say 0.6 seconds, or you want it to be non-aggressive, you put 1.5 seconds. The, the person behind you has an adaptive control, but he doesn't want to use it, so he's just going to drive as he regularly drives. Right? But because you have pressed that, the, the time headway between you and the vehicle in front is reduced. So you will get through the two of you will get through much faster than if you were driving the way you're driving, right? It would take uh, just much less time. And that is the major bottleneck at the intersection. Question. Yeah. Um, so this reminds me of one thing. So um, some of the people in the room might be remember this better than me, but my understanding was like when TCP, the transmission control protocol, was changed in the 80s, it was partly because internet routers were essentially merging together IP headers, and then this called like a collective synchronization throughout the system, mm -hmm. which then led to crashes, and that's why the rule was changed, this additive increase, multiplicative decrease rule. Now, in this example, you're essentially synchronizing cars together, so you can imagine situa I believe all your story for a single junction, but if you had several junctions to connect it together, you could end up causing a synchronization here then feeds into the next junction, synchronizes the cars there, which then feeds back. Mm -hmm. So you could end up with situations where in a network situation you have to be very careful about the green times you give between different junctions because you could end up making synchronizations that lead to instability. Yes, so I'm, de I'm decoupling those completely, right? I'm saying that, that the green time, yes, so I understand what you mean. So here I'm not changing the signals at all, so the green times are staying the same, right? As a result, you can have greater throughput of traffic, which could lead to large queues, and will lead to large queues. But you don't want to permit that because that will lead to a saturation of the link and, and the upstream thing will get congested. So we're going to say, okay, we have this possibility of doubling, but what I'm going to do, I'm just going to reduce my cycle time by 20%. So that will reduce the queues by 20%. You shouldn't admit twice as much traffic. I mean, that's a bigger issue, right, about how much traffic you're willing to accept. So that's a larger issue of, congest of control, but I don't see the synchronization problem as uh, propagating, because I'm not trying to control the individual lights, right, and so I'm not going to, there's no feedback as such. If you try to implement a green wave, for example, with this... Well, oh, the implementation of the green wave is, is just the way it is done now, right? The only thing it requires is what is the travel time between across the link. So that doesn't change. I'm not saying people should go faster on the roads. I'm just saying they should go fast. They're not even going faster. They should go more quickly. I mean, don't leave, don't sip your coffee or read that you are, <laughs> you know, respond to your cell phone while you're waiting at the intersection, but just react uh, the way you ought to react, right? With your slides uh, just one more thing, and then, and which is a so this is the way in which congestion is growing, right? And just to say, we talk about freeway, but 60% of congestion occurs inside in the city streets. 
But there's a more troubling aspect to me, which is now 527 cities are, have more than one million in population. And the car ownership is growing much faster than population ownership. So in 2014, about 83 million cars were sold. And in, in 2018, they expect to set 100 million. In terms of greenhouse gases in the US, transportation accounts for 26%. Around the world, it's 14%. But this massive increase in population, so it's possible to accommodate that by this kind of uh, technology. But there are side effects which are far worse, right? which is the emissions from these things. And so we need also to worry about the kinds of things that biology is talking about, right? Getting people on to mass transit or electrifying all of this stuff. But that will lead to pollution coming from the electricity sector unless we move to renewables. So, there's a, so each of these problems is buried in a bigger problem, right? That we, I'm done. Thanks. your platooning scheme would work or what the effect would be in the most congested uh, uh, peak region mm -hmm. um, where you may, so I'm just thinking of downtown Austin where at peak travel times you may sit through the same light three times mm -hmm. just because when it hits green the next, there's no room to move to the next um, Yeah, no, no, uh -huh. right. So have you done any there's no avoidance of that, right? So what is happening in downtown Austin is your links are getting saturated. So that even when I have a green, I cannot move because the, 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 there's no place to move to, right? So that's an oversaturation condition. So that kind of condition, whether you're moving, <laughs> whether you have a platooning or no platooning, doesn't matter, nobody can move. Well, in part, this is because um, I'm thinking of one street where everyone goes through to cross downtown, yeah. and the greens are timed. Yes. There's green everywhere, but nobody is moving. Yeah, because they're saturated. Because of the time lag. No, 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 no. no. There is, yeah, there is a saturation effect. No, it's a saturation effect is the reason nobody can move. Is it's, it happens here too on on Oxford. The, 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 the link is very small, so it gets saturated, and you get a green, but it doesn't help you because that link is already saturated. Now, it could be, so, so the particular thing, so you should teach two, you should treat short links together as one link, and so those lies should be just run together. Right, so just make it into a long link, and then some of the, some of the problems are alleviated. And the uh, data that you have shown in the slide 8 or so, like mm -hmm. the speed of the cars, yes. the first car is very slow, second car is little faster, etc. Yeah. Essentially, the first three, four cars are slow. Yes. And presumably, that's because this, the red light is a sudden like a yes. signal, right? Yes. So if they are primed about red light. Sure. Those are all things. So that's a, there's a reaction time, which may be, I mean, varies a lot. It can be as much as a 100 milliseconds or longer. You saw in there, there was a few seconds. In, in that particular example. Like so so, so you, can, you can do that in two ways. Either you have a countdown timer, which says in China is everywhere. Pardon me? Clock counts down in India. Yeah, count, yes, in India. Or here we see, you can see the pedestrian <laughs> cross, so I can use, use that to say when the thing is right. So definitely having a countdown timer. So again, a low-tech solution, right, which says, OK, I'll be ready to start. Or you can have a more fancy thing, right? Which tells you, like the BMW story, it tells you that uh, the light is going to turn green in three seconds, five seconds, two seconds, whatever. Then that could be as part of your uh, the leader of the platoon will just automatically get the thing moving. So you'd shave off a few seconds there, right? Mm -hmm. Steve? So to, uh, to the point you made in the last slide, mm -hmm. uh, besides electrification of transportation, if uh, driverless cars and also uh, this sharing business really both take off, well, would that drastically... You mean sharing rides? 
or you mean so sharing cars, like driverless cars so, so I don't need to I don't want it, I don't drive more than say two hours per day per se. Yeah. So if my, if I don't own a car, but whenever I need a car there will be a driverless car that comes by. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then maybe the ownership structure will be completely different. Well, then you don't need that it, it, it depends on, the, it depends. So if you're saying that somebody will drive your car instead, so the car ownership will be less. But if the demand is not going to change, so same number of vehicles are traveling the road, except it's your vehicle coming twice. That doesn't change anything, right? Now you can go one step further and say, well, we're going to, re because the, there'll be fewer cars parked, that'll provide you a savings. Yes, they'll provide you some savings, right? But that's not going to reduce the transportation demand. And that's the same story with if it's Uber and all the cars are Uber. Now, if it's automated vehicles, I don't see how that is going to reduce. Unless you say we're going to pack people, you know, five people per vehicle. Oh, so that I agree. That will reduce the transportation demand. The opportunity for optimization seems to be stronger with uh, automated vehicles. Uh, possibly, right? Possibly. Okay, so I, I'm promoting sort of low tech. <laughs> <laughs> solutions to a problem, which seems to me that one can try, right, in San Jose or whatever, some area, as the ACC cars are, I mean, man, all the high-end cars have ACC in their thing, and the vehicle manufacturers are getting a lot more aggressive by allowing it in stop-and-go traffic, so you can leave it on ACC and stop and just move as the car in front of you moves. But I'm worried about the, the thing that if you make it easier, I mean, you just grow, the demand will grow, right? But that's that's the, the other part of the story. Any other questions? Okay. Let's take from you. Thanks. Now.